Hello, I'm Brittany with Frog God Games, and today we're talking to Edwin, the author of Dwarven Fiasco. Edwin, how are you? I am doing well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing good myself. So, you're the author of Dwarven Fiasco, which sounds yep. honestly very entertaining just from the title. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a bit about the story and the premise of it? Well, there's a dwarves that live in this town called Cleft, and they've gotten a little lazy over the years. And they no longer have their, uh, their skills sharp. They've been eating and drinking and having a good time, as you know, dwarves will do when the boss is away. And next door is a temple of the dwarven gods up in a cliff. And some years ago, there was a bit of a uh, visitor from outer space, shall we say, um, that interrupted one of the big rituals they were having and killed most of the people in the temple corrupted a lot of the magic that was around there and turned the uh, head priest into um, trouble. And uh, so now that the temple is needed again, uh, the dwarves of Clef don't have the skills themselves to go clean it out. And so of course, they're going to look to a party of brave adventurers to come and help them out. You had me at space aliens come and invade the temple. That's, That's right. amazing. So other than me, who is going to love this adventure? At its core, I would say this is a dungeon crawl, um, but it's definitely a dungeon crawl with uh, a sense of humor and with a lot of weirdness to it. Uh, sort of I, I pushed on the corrupted magic and was able to use that to come up with a lot of uh, creatures that are not quite traditional and also there's some interesting spirits there that are not necessarily malevolent uh, that the party can certainly chat with. Uh, there's a little bit of sort of puzzle and figuring things out in there so something for that it's not overwhelming so it's it's mostly people I think that likes a um, I will say a light-hearted but deadly dungeon crawl. So there's a little bit for everyone. That's the goal. That's the goal, certainly. For the people who want to support this uh, project's release, how could they do that? Uh, well, we, we are going to be funding on Indiegogo. And of course, you can go and buy yourself a PDF or and a hard copy. We're going to have it available in 5th edition and an OSR version. We know that the, um, the current state of the world has kind of hit everyone a little hard. So for those who maybe aren't able to support on Indiegogo, um, how best uh, can they support the project's release? I mean, I think I feel like supporting gaming is really what it's all about, right? And yeah. that is best done, I think, through playing games and sharing games with new, um, new people, getting new players involved. Um, but it's also, I think, getting involved yourself. So obviously what we're asking for is um, in this particular case is somebody to come and buy something. Uh, but because we are producing things, we are also of course hire people. And that also keeps the game industry turning and helps support us doing things. So uh, for example, just to lay it out there a little bit, uh, I am always looking for some good people to help with uh, converting rules into fifth edition. And this is something that is uh, requires somebody who has both a good understanding of the rules, is creative, and has a good attention to detail. So there's a lot of sort of skills that work in there. Um, uh, so that's, that's certain something people can do to get involved. And that helps, you know, make things happen. And it doesn't cost anything. In fact, not in a big way, but in fact, it does the reverse. Was working for a gaming company something that you always thought about doing, or was it something you kind of just fell into? And if so, like, what did you do beforehand? I don't think that I even had dreams as a kid of writing for Dragon Magazine. Like, I, I don't think that the idea of working in gaming ever really occurred to me. So I'm an engineer and an engineering professor. Uh, that's what I did before. It's what I'm still doing. Uh, I have always done something artistic in a amateur or semi-pro manner. So I've worked in live theater. I've worked in you know music concerts, that kind of stuff. So the gaming, I mean, I did. I definitely fell into it. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I I sent some comments to uh, Zach about Whisper and Venom. 
uh, just as he was publishing it. And that uh, led to friendship and eventually work collaboration. And some years later uh, led to me uh, joining first working for and then becoming a part of Frog God. It was really about, and I think this about most of the business world, it's really about the relationships, um, you know, doing good work, but also meeting people and having them trust you and like working with you. Um, I think, you know, if, I think if you do those two things, uh, then you'll, you'll find work, you know, in whatever, whatever field you're, you're interested in. I feel like those are the two main keys. So you said you were an engineer. Um, sorry, that stuck out to me. How has being an engineer influenced the way you design and write games? So specifically, I'm a structural engineer. So my, I, I work on buildings and bridges. I mean, it means that I think about the, the physical environment of the adventure uh, in a sort of professional way, uh, you know? And so uh, one, of the, one of the things I remember working with Zach on um, Death and Taxes, which is this sort of big, in, in this uh, big multi-story building, uh, was really thinking about what what does a building have to be and let's make sure it's realistic. And I also remember, I remember playing in a, I think it was like a Call of Cthulhu game. It was a con game. And we were, you know, wandering around and looking at this and that. And then I said, well, I want to go down this hallway, but I feel like we're going to run into this ramp that we've already been on that goes from the second floor down to the first floor. And the keeper looked at me and said, you know, I've been running this game for however long, and you're absolutely right. I don't think anyone has ever, like, been bothered by that before, because, it, you know, the, the map just has this hallway going right through this other thing. And so I, I, bring, I bring a definite uh, spatial thinking to adventures, and I think that definitely influences the types of adventures I write. You know, some people think about uh, relationships and that their adventures are all about that, you know, about how people work together or how you're influencing these people. And mine tend to be a little bit more uh, spatially focused and maybe mechanically focused in that sense. That's really cool, though, because I, I figured you'd have a different kind of pr approach to it because, you know, like you said, a lot of people think about the relationships, but I can't tell you the number of times I've been in a dungeon like with a group or something, and it bothers me that the dungeon is not structurally laid out. And I'm like, we should be like in a in a lake right now, and yet we're on the second story. Right. You know, right. just <laughs> random things. Like I know it's a magic place, but it still bothers them. So well, and I think it's it's frustrating because each each player brings their own reality to the table in order to help them solve problems. Right. So if you're a person that really believes in uh, understands economics, then when you're thinking about the problem that your characters are in, you're going to think about them perhaps in economic terms. And, you know, maybe you will think, well, this town shouldn't exist because there's no way for them to be getting an income. Therefore, there must be something going on. They must have an underground economy. I'm going to go look for the black market. Right. That's something that you're going to think about because of your training as an econ uh, economist or whatever. And similarly, you know, you're saying, well, we should be in a lake and therefore there must be something else going on. Like you sort of bring your own reality to the world. And yeah. if that's not part of the riddle, then it's just confusing. You know, it's a red herring that you've made up yourself. Uh, that's, that's a very good point. So, and I think that actually kind of draws into, I was going to ask you how, like, what advice would you give to young people trying to break into the industry? I definitely think you've touched on something like they definitely kind of like the way you bring your own reality into the game that makes your games unique in a way. Partly people can bring that into it, but what other advice would you have for young gamers? Yeah, I mean, I think so you're right. That adage is write what you know, right? It's to sort of <laughs> cho choose whatever it is that uh, you can make most real for your audience. Uh, I think that's part of it. I think the, I mean, I think the classic advice for all writers and maybe all creative types you know read a lot um read broadly like read outside of fantasy outside of gaming because i think that way you can bring something new into gaming um and obviously keep making stuff you know work on um you know write your first five or seven bad adventures 
and then uh, you know they'll get better. Uh, or, or whatever part of gaming you're interested in, right? If you're hoping to be an artist, or if you're hoping to be an editor, editor or um, a producer of interviews, you know, whatever it is, right? You uh, you do them and you keep doing them, and then you they get better and you meet people, and then eventually your work and the people you meet line up. Somebody has a need, you have a skill, and I think you're ready to roll. But I think I think it is super important to be to push past the the genre so that you can refresh and renew what we're doing. You know, we, we can all try to repeat and none of us will do it successfully, but we can all try to repeat the Hobbit or whatever it is, but that's, that's sort of in-house and, you know, people like, uh, you know, Zach has some exciting thoughts about European history that are not well represented in gaming. I mean, there's a lot of European stuff in gaming, obviously, but, but to you know, sort of approach them that way, or different knowledge about politics or uh, legal interests, whatever it is, you know, you've got something that most of us don't have, and if you can bring that into gaming, that's interesting for the rest of us. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I mean, I mean, everybody always says, you know, oh, like and subscribe or like and share, but like do that too. <laughs> yeah, please do that. Please, <laughs> please support our project. Also, it's it's good to know that they're like you know, even just getting into the gaming industry helps a ton and there are like smaller ways and bigger ways that anyone can you know make a living and do something they love and support something they love yeah speaking of things that you can do in the gaming industry the artwork for this project is really nice i like it a lot it's very stylistic very different from some of the other games i've seen um so how how did you go about um, working with the art director to create such like thematic art? So we did a couple things specifically, and I am I'm I'm super super excited about the art for this. It, it turned out you know one one of the uh, one of the great things about writing for gaming is you get to write something and you picture something in your head, whatever, and then at some point you or somebody else puts together the art notes, and all of a sudden art comes back. And it's so much better uh, most of the time than what you like. This this picture behind me here is you know is just a few sentences in the adventure about some uh, cooks that have become skeletons and some giant rats and an encounter between them that the players uh, might run into. And this is so much more dynamic and energetic uh, than you know the few sentences that just say you know there's two skeleton cooks and a whatever whatever it says in the adventure. Um, but the, to answer your question, <laughs> um, so I actually started with um, our graphic artist and layout artist, uh, Lisanne Houdon, who um, I worked with her to create the, a, set, a new set of uh, dwarven runes and to create a color palette. So I actually, you know, came up with a sort of 10 colors and the set of runes and those got shared with all of the artists and then along with the art notes that I wrote up where I gave some examples of the type of art I was looking for especially for the cartoons I said hey here's here's something that I'm or the, the black and white work uh, this is the type of thing I'm interested in and your job is to obviously here's here's the piece of excitement that you're trying to create and I'd like you to bring in some of these runes and I'd like you to use this color palette. So having all of that tied all the art together uh, really nicely, but I, and I left them uh, enough freedom. You know, I said, this is the excitement. You figure out how you want to show it. Uh, I just want this excitement to show through. And I think that came out really well. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm super, super pleased uh, with all of the art and the layout is looking fantastic. Uh, and it all looks like it was done intentionally together uh, because it was so. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that the art is very dynamic. I can tell that you told them, here's the vibe, go with it, just from yep. the picture behind you, because <laughs> it is, it's incredible. I, I think that's wonderful. So without giving too much away, um, what would you say your favorite aspect of the story is? I think it's the fun uh, creatures that are encountered. So there's some uh, food that, you know, 
was left long enough under the influence of this uh, space magic that it's taken on a life of its own. Uh, there's some humorous undead. There's some earth elementals and some other things like that that have all gotten just a touch of this corruption that came in that, that hit the high priest. And so I think it's really, again, it's, it's the all of the things that you sort of think you recognize, but then they're just a little bit, uh, it's like a, being in a fun house, you know, it's mirrors just change it a little bit to uh, make it more interesting, hopefully more interesting. So it's a lot like our world, but just a little warped. <laughs> yeah. If you have dwarves in your, yeah, exactly. Yes. Oh, I do. I'm five two. So. Well, okay. <laughs> I'm one of them. <laughs> how are you with a, How are you with a warhammer? <laughs> you know, I could be better. Uh, well, keep working. Keep working. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sitting down and talking with us today. Um, Pleasure. Letting us know about this intensely intriguing adventure. <laughs> um, I am going to get myself a copy of Dwarven Fiasco. But thank you for sitting down with us. Well, thank you. Everyone who's interested, please go check out Indiegogo. Um, the link will be in the description and support this project. Whether you share it, whether you play it, all your support matters. So thank you.